so I ended up selling all of my pets and Spencers and, and my vinyl records. And I just, I just gave myself such a hard time. Like, my gosh, like how, how much did you spend on this? I think a lot of people go through that process sometimes when they get, get rid of their things. And so I had to really say like, you know, that really was just a decision that I thought would make me happy at the time. Like that is something I tell myself a lot. It's like, I just thought that this was going to help. And so you can't really shame a previous part of yourself when that person may not have known better. This is the Personal Finance Show. Hi, I'm Bo Humphreys, and this is episode 98 of The Personal Finance Show. Sarah Lee Kane wants you to be open to opportunities and to make independence a priority. Sarah was born in Hong Kong, grew up in Canada, has lived in Australia, South Korea, and China, and is currently living in the U.S. Sarah worked mainly as a teacher, but the key to her survival and success was to be open to opportunities along the way. Knowing that she couldn't be a teacher in the U.S. if she moved there from China with her husband and new son, Sarah looked into ways to make money online. Sarah ended up finding freelance writing as something she could do from anywhere in the world and focused on personal finance writing. Today, Sarah makes over $100,000 a year working part-time from home, creating content for financial brands and online publications. It's not easy to create in-demand content and get paid for it, but her desire is to be independent and to be free to spend her time the way she wants keep her on track. Sarah is also the host of the Beyond the Dollar podcast, where she has deep and honest conversations about how money affects our well-being. Sarah joined me from Jacksonville, Florida to share her personal finance story. So my earliest money memory was when my family and I first moved to Canada and we were looking at Canadian currency and I remember my mom sitting down with us on the carpet and showing us a loony and she said, look at this, this is like gold. And I remember my sister and I just staring at this thing, you know, moving around, trying to get the reflection off the sun. And we were, we felt like we were like pirates getting pieces of gold, (laughs) but it was just like, we were in awe of the fact that there was this piece of coin that we could use to buy things in this new country it's like i remember in slow-mo like my mom took it out of her coin purse oh and my your sister mom and I just, revealed this yeah and my mom my sister and i just kind of like gasped like it was we were <laughs> we were like five so you know awesome. can you imagine a five-year-old just being in all yeah, the yeah. but yeah <laughs> oh i love that because it, i mean at one time that would have been what a gold piece might have looked like right Mm-hmm. and uh, mm-hmm. it would have been worth a lot more than <laughs> whatever the loonies are made of now. Is it some copper, I guess? And, I don't uh, even know, to be honest. Right? Nothing, mm-hmm. t- obviously, too valuable. Otherwise, uh, it, w- it would be worth more than a dollar, right? <laughs> exactly. So, <laughs> or Canadian dollar anyway. So what year is this then? You're five? This was in, oh, now you're going to like get me to reveal my age. But, oh, okay. Like, so what, no, 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 it's, you, it's you fine. It's fine. It was like nine, <laughs> it was like 19... <laughs> 88, I think, okay. when we first moved there. Yeah. So you're uh, 983, which is like full, like beginning of millennial, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Like I'm in the older spectrum of, of a millennial, if you want to get technical about it. I'm in the ancient uh, millennial oh, spectrum. Oh, well, there you go. <laughs> uh, 1980. Some people decide that it's uh, part of the millennials. Some people say Gen X. It's really in the middle. x right? Mm-hmm. That's that's where I fall in. But you're, you're full millennial. So 1988, you're five. You moved to Canada from where? From Hong Kong. Okay. And so you have uh, like a citizenship or a passport or something from Hong Kong? Yeah. So it's, I think it's called the right to abode. So it's like a permanent residency card. So I don't yeah, necessarily okay. have like a passport. I can say I'm a citizen, but I don't think legally that's what I am. So, okay. So you come <laughs> from Hong Kong, you come to Canada and then eventually just, I guess, what, what happens naturally as a kid? Do you end up becoming a resident of Canada or... Or how does that work? We were actually became citizens. I think it was like the 125th Canadian Canada's 125th anniversary, which was really cool because okay. I think I was in. I'm pretty sure I was in grade six at the time, and so, so you know, in grade school, you, yeah. So in grade school, you always kind of have um, like these ceremonies or um, 
assemblies there you go and so it was like the day before we went to hawaii and they're like oh congratulations to sarah and olivia was my sister's name for becoming citizens and then we went up and got a medal which that's, that's cool. the part i remember and not remembering getting my citizenship which i know that's like a okay <laughs> a weird so thing you because you would have had but... to go through some kind of government ceremony as well yeah, so I mean, my parents would have had to take the the test, the yeah. naturalization test, not us, because we were we were too young, and um, so yeah, we would have had to have gone to like an office. Uh, gosh, I'm so bad at I don't know what it's called, but it's a place. Oh yeah, yeah, you get sure. Your, you get your citizenship, and so I don't remember that, but I remember getting a medal for it at, 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 school. <laughs> at school. So they, they <laughs> yeah. celebrated this thing at school just to welcome you as the as the group, like in the, mm -hmm. for the, the rest of the classmates to to help celebrate you as well. That was the mm -hmm. idea. Yes. Okay. Cool. So okay. So you're you're in Canada. The loony is awesome. Of, of course, and that you're living all of your mo most of your uh, childhood in Canada. You don't know anything other than being Canadian w uh, as a kid, really, right? Well, we have relatives all over the world, but mainly in Hong Kong, and so we would go for maybe like a couple weeks at a time here and there. I call myself Canadian, but I yeah. spent quite a, still spent quite a lot of time in Hong Kong. Yeah, yeah, that's awesome. Uh, you, 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 you kept going back and forth. So you, you're keeping like what, what are sort of your roots, right? In Canada, and now of course now you're in the states, and you lived in a couple other countries. So you're like a citizen of the world, basically. <laughs> yeah, essentially. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, I, I think it is cool that you call yourself Canadian because you did spend your formative years here, and you are a Canadian citizen. Uh, and now you have a, 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 what's your status in the U.S.? So it's just a green card right now. Yeah, and how long does that process take? And I'm jumping ahead, but I like. Doing um, that. gosh, okay. For me, it was a little bit long. Okay, it was long and fast. So my husband and I were both living in China, and so I had applied for a green card there instead of going through Canada. It just was a little oh, bit easier. Interesting. It was easier in the sense because we were we're both living there we had work permits and so we could just instead of flying back to canada i could just do it um in the u.s and so what it ended up happening was we submitted all our paperwork they claimed they sent a letter to us and we never got it oh. anyways it, we were we were like i was getting really nervous but anyways as soon as they found out that i never got this letter they sort of um as soon as we handed in the paperwork that was needed i got a meeting an appointment fairly quickly and so we just had to make sure we got our paperwork and all of that and so i think it took i'd say like a year just because of the little bit of mix-up that was involved but really luckily for me just be I, you know i'm a canadian citizen it's you know we were just talking about privilege for the podcast it's a little bit easier for a canadian to get u.s permanent residency yes. so because i'm canadian my husband's a naturalized citizen it was a little bit easier i didn't have to have as much paperwork so for example if you were living in china you had to have all your documents translated into English that costs quite a bit of money. Of course. I think for some, I, I could be totally wrong, so please do not quote me on this, is that if you have bank statements and such, you have to get the currency converted to U.S. dollars if it wasn't in local currency or U.S. Like currency. A, officially, like from like the bank has to do it? Or yeah, like... so you have to, yeah, or the bank, or you have to get a, like one of the notaries in a China notary. to get a notary yeah. or a translator that the consulate approves of. It's something that certifies them as not forged documents. Right, right. <laughs> exactly, yeah. exactly. So we ended up having to translate a few documents but it wasn't nearly I think as much as some people would have so we were looking in that sense that it, it took a little bit I'm gonna put this in air quotes faster than what other people would have had to go through now, now the green card I don't know how long that lasts but do you is there a timeline as to when you can then apply to be a, a resident or citizen or however that uh, the next step is so my green card lasts for 10 years 10 years and okay typically again it, it depends on your situation I think typically it's like if you've been in the country for three years and it depends on your spouse's status as well, you can actually start to apply for citizenship. I think after, other than that, it's like five years. So yeah, I mean, if you decide you want to become one at all, if not, you can just t technically renew your green card if you qualify. Okay, so you might just mm -hmm. do that. Okay, that's mm -hmm. a little jump into the future. Now we're going <laughs> to, <laughs> just because I was curious about, like, you know, not, not a lot of people, I mean, I know some, but uh, not a lot of people have, um, you know, citizenship or residency or, or, or work permits in multiple countries. So it's a, I, I always feel like yours is a very unique situation and, and interesting, you know, to navigate all of this. Yeah, uh, it's funny because I guess I get to talk to people and they just ask, oh, where you're from or where you've lived. And, yeah. and so 
I'll start mentioning something and I don't realize I'm kind of teasing out the rest of my story. And they're like, wait, <laughs> wait, you lived where? Wait, oh, wait, you were here? And I was like, yeah. And so I would just, again, continue the conversation. And I didn't realize, I guess in hindsight, I should have, but I didn't realize how many places I've lived or how, how like all the things that I've done before I was 30 um, yeah. in terms of like where I've traveled, how I've worked and, and all of the things. And so it's it's been fun reliving it through podcasts like this one or you know, with other people when I, when I speak with them. Yeah. And so we're going to, we're going to try to touch on all of them now because there, there are, there are lots and I <laughs> tend to, to go on tangents like we just did. So, uh, hopefully we'll get to all of them, but we'll, uh, we'll do our best. So let's go back to you then you're, you're a kid, you find out money exists. Now, does that make you want money? How are you as a kid? Do you want to make money? Are you like the lemonade stand kid or are you like not knowing or caring about money? So I was a little bit of a rebel. Okay. <laughs> my entire family, I know, can you tell? My entire <laughs> family was in the accounting business. Oh, okay, yeah. Or worked in banks. So like my cousins now are all like, you know, vice presidents of like major banks in Hong Kong, things like that. My mom was an Big accountant. banking family, yeah. Yeah, okay. my mom was an accountant. She did bookkeeping for my dad's business. Numbers, everyone's right. numbers. Right, everyone's numbers. I mean, I knew QuickBooks, like the old school QuickBooks of a young age. Old like I knew all the terms, like I knew my way around spreadsheet, you know, all before the age of 12. Wow. And I remember thinking like, this is so boring. Like I do not <laughs> care about this stuff. Like why are people geeking out over spreadsheets? Absolutely. I say so ironically now that I'm obsessed with them, but yeah. it was one of those where I'm like, like who cares? Like I, all I want to do is just make enough money to have fun. Yeah. Uh, because I was like, kind of like the, uh, the kid that wanted to go to art school and make paintings and sell it for millions of dollars or travel that's around the awesome. world. So that's young Sarah was the the rebel against this, these orderly uh, spreadsheet uh, yes. you know, people. <laughs> and you just wanted to do something different. And uh, so were you able to make moves to do that early? Yeah. yeah. So I remember it was so funny. We would have clubs after school. I think lunchtime we had clubs in our elementary school. And I would like almost purposely pick ones that my friends didn't because I wanted to like be the only one and I could recount all the awesome things that happened during club times. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I know. <laughs> Again, a rebel, right? I also picked like art classes. For some reason, I knew at a very young age that's what I enjoyed. And so I wanted to do like drawing classes and, and all of those things. That was a big thing. And I remember my mom bought me a film camera when I was younger okay. because she saw that I had an interest in photography. Yeah, yeah. And so I was really into that and I knew it was really funny too because considering all my parents or my parents and all of my relatives were into the banking and accounting and all of that, they were very into stability. Yes. And so yeah. they always impressed upon me to have like a nice stable career, you know, to to do all the things I would get me a good job. And so that was always in the back of my mind. And so I knew that the art world isn't exactly as stable as some other yeah, not really. careers. <laughs> you know, just being an artist wasn't as stable. And so I was like, oh, what if I became an art teacher? Like I can get a permanent contract teaching in Ontario and I could still have my love of art and have that nice stable career. And so I knew as a young kid, this is looking back so weird like i remember being six and seven i'm like i'm gonna be a teacher when i grow up that's the the thing that combines the two things you're able to have the yeah. best of both both worlds in that yeah case. and i knew i loved traveling and i also remember meeting exchange teachers or teachers yeah. who would get jobs on cruise ships that they would do in the summer and so really? i was like yeah. yeah and i was like oh that is perfect so i can do art i can have a stable job and I can travel because I can take this job anywhere in the world. So when I was a young kid, that was like my career goal. Wasn't there a whole uh, show about uh, uh, kids on a cruise ship uh, going to high school? Breaker High. Yes, yes. Okay, I did watch that. <laughs> did you watch, did you watch <laughs> I did, it? I did. <laughs> probably, probably not inspirational or anything, but that's uh, just what it reminded me of. So you know, th th so are you, you're making moves then to get there? Like you just don't care about money at this point? Is that like, is money having any impact on you? No, I mean, I remember being pretty frugal as a kid. Like, yeah. it was not because I didn't like spending money. It was more like, well, why am I buying these Air Jordans when this pair of, like, high tops, other high tops look just as fine? I can use this money for something else. So it was more like 
this is not a value to me and it's like way too expensive for what I would be willing to pay for, I'm not going to buy it. It's like you, you were like a mindful spender from early, early age. Yeah. So it, I remember that. I remember like my father had friends who sold really cheap toys from China. Like they would bring it in and they would sell it to my dad like at cost. And they had like electric scooters and things like that. And I would just refuse them. And I'm like, I, I don't need those things. Why would I, why would I want to buy them? So the, that, <laughs> that definitely was frugal. But in other ways I would like overspend. Um, okay. and when I was in high school, I was really like into trying to impress people with like being the cool person. Being and a so different. I would, yeah. So I would buy like vinyl records um ah, i had okay. huge i had a huge like pez dispenser collection like hundreds and hundreds of it like i was nicknamed pez girl at one point like that's how many i had <laughs> and so i remember so it was, it was funny because i'm like i would use money to impress people to because i had pretty low self-esteem i think by the time high school came so okay, i was using okay. money to f like make myself feel more worthy as a person but then i was also like well, I don't care about this. I'm not going to buy it. So there was like those two yeah, things. It, real it's dichotomy almost, there. Yeah, yeah. And it was like, oh, I don't care about money. I refuse to be in the financial world, but then I want money to help me travel the world. I'm going to purposely pick a career. So it was like really like these weird conflicts. Well, and that's a struggle for a lot of creative people, right? Is uh, sort of rejecting money as, a, as an, an evil or, you know, whatever uh, the, the negative uh, term is. But need knowing, then realizing I need it for something. Yeah, and I think what I've what I've learned really looking back is that all the while I was using money as a tool for something, whether it was positive or negative. So like it was positive in the way that, oh great, I was using money to fuel a career and hobbies that I love, right? To to teach, to travel around the world, and all of those. That was great. However, it was negative because it was used to mask my feelings of unworthiness, mm. you know, all of that, and so. I was still using money towards whatever I wanted to feel, um, whether that was positive or negative. Yeah, like a cope, it, the money or at least enabled your coping uh, mechanism, whatever mm -hmm. that would have been at the time, which I guess, yeah, so spending, like, but, but spending on create, like making yourself more creative. That's what it seemed to, it seems to be a uh, Pez dispensers and all that kind of thing. It started out like I was really interested in it. I thought, oh, these are really cool Pez dispensers. But then it became <laughs> like, it's my thing and people knew me as it's my thing. And so it got me like attention, which was something that I didn't realize I was craving. Ah, okay. So you were like, I like this attention. And now I'm going to do whatever uh, I need to do to get more of it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I mean, I, I could see how that can lead people down, uh, you know, spending hole or, oh, I, people like it when I buy them things. So I'm just going to buy everybody things like that kind of example. And I did buy things for friends. Um, yeah. You know, many pr people were appreciative. I think I, I did buy other things to make friends or I would buy myself things to have hobbies where I thought people would be interested in. And so I'd make friends mm. that way. So yeah, all of those. Well, we're all learning how to socialize at this, at this time of our lives, right? You know, we're just trying to figure out what it is that we like and what it is that makes us happy. And I mean, it sounds like a lot of people go through this in different permutations, I think. Yeah. I mean, I think I remember when I, so I ended up selling all of my pest dispensers and, and my vinyl records. And I just, I just gave myself such a hard time. Like, Oh. My gosh, like how, how much did you spend on this? I think a lot of people go through that process sometimes when yeah. they get, get rid of their yeah. things. And so yeah. I had to really say like, you know, that really was just a decision that I thought would make me happy at the time. Like that is something I tell myself a lot. It's like, I just thought that this was going to help. And so you can't really shame a previous part of yourself when that person may not have known better that's right you're learning yeah yeah we're always growing and regret is a you know a, in the world in the addiction world where i come from is a really terrible thing right you can't really have regret or you're just going to be miserable about all the things that you've done i like that way of framing it that you were just learning and so yeah maybe you wouldn't do the same thing uh, today but that's you know, you're a different person now. Yeah, I like that a lot. So, where did the money come from to buy all this stuff? Where, where did you just start working somewhere? I saved up like birthday money. In the Asian culture, we have something called Chinese New Year or Lunar New Year, depending on where you're from. And so, you would get money f from your relatives. Red pockets. Yes, red pockets exactly. <laughs> so I hoarded that stuff. Okay. Uh, I hoarded it. We were like, okay, now, now, like I have a couple hundred bucks. I'm gonna go spend it. On gotcha whatever yeah <laughs> so so no like no work or did you start work at all in high school i started working 
when I was 18, my parents didn't want work to interfere with my studies. And so I see. I did work, I would work in the summer starting when I was 16, but then I would stop it when I started school again. What, uh, what would you do in the summers? I worked at a summer camp and then I worked at the Gap, which was apparently a very coveted job back then because you can get discounts oh. on Gap. And I was like, <laughs> I don't care. Like, I'm like, I'm just here to work. <laughs> but I guess my friends thought it was pretty cool. I mean, if they sold Pez dispensers, maybe that would have been lucrative for you. I think I, I would not have left with a paycheck if I worked at a place <laughs> with Pez dispensers. <laughs> I would. Do you have photos of this collection, like from from then? Because I would. I am interested in to like see the the extent of it. You know what? I I'm gonna have to take it up because I sold them on Etsy, so I did have to take photos for the listings. Um, okay. If I if I have any, I'll I'll, uh, I'll send you some. I just like it would be curious to see some like really interesting ones. I'm sure you, you came across some. Do you, do you have like a one in mind? Yeah, so there's one. It's uh, actually Wile E. Coyote. It's a okay. it's a little plastic kind of uh, statue, I guess you'd say. So it's like a it's a mountain, and yeah. then Wile E. Coyote has a shovel, and so when you press the button, he he moves, and then he goes into the little like there's a little hole in the mountain, and then out comes a Pez dispenser. So he's like shoveling a Pez dispenser. Okay, so like not mm -hmm. your regular size Pez dispenser, but no, this is like a special one, and then it yeah. had. Another one I remember now too is it's a belt clip, so it's a big, it's like a round. Oh, it's awesome! It's about I'd say about half the size of a personal pan pizza. If anybody knows what that is, <laughs> yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. So it was I a do, belt clip. I do, unfortunately. Yeah. <laughs> so it's a belt clip. It's clear on the the front, yeah. and it says it says Pez across it, and then you could see the individual candies. And so you press a button, and then it the Pez goes around in a circle, and then it eventually dispenses one out. So what? if you were like really hankering, yeah, if you're really hankering for a Pez, you just got this like clip on thing for your uh, side of your pants or whatever and just eat now pez. I, i'm gonna keep talking about <laughs> pez for a little longer for some reason I, I i just i don't know why but um did you like did you enjoy the taste of pez because i've always just been on the fence about pez you know what i'm gonna be honest i initially liked it but i don't not not I just now, like the right? dispensers yeah 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 it became more about the dispensers like because like to me the candy is whatever it's actually kind of generic uh mm -hmm. it's it was about the dispensers instead that's just that could, that's the last question i had about pez so <laughs> let's go back so you're earning money but you're saving it to buy these things that we just talked about do you have plans uh to become to go to, to teacher's college then was that like just your plan forever? I remember I was like, okay, I'm going to go to a teacher's college and I'm going to pay my way through school. So I, I was, again, really independent in that sense where I'm like, I don't need to rely on anybody. You know, I'll okay, do it myself. Okay, yeah. And just, and it was also like one of those just in case my parents didn't approve and they didn't want to help me out, I could do it myself. And so, That's so important, right? Autonomy mm -hmm. is, uh, we, you know, I was just talking about that with uh, Aaron, Aaron Lowry, uh, Broke Millennial, because she comes from privilege. Uh, and we're like, oh, you know, why don't your parents just give you money? And uh, like autonomy, right? That's like, mm -hmm. it's so important. We don't even think about that, right? Yeah. And that's a big value of mine too. And so okay, yeah, yeah. Um, I saved, so the, the summer before university, I saved up all of that for school. And then I got, I got a loan. I got a, I think it's OSAP. Yep. I think yep. for tuition, I think like for half of the tuition of the first year. And then okay. I got a, I got a job at a restaurant, worked my tail off for tips and all of that. And so I paid my way through school that way. And uh, just for everyone's uh, uh, you know, comparison, to, you went, this was in Ontario, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. And tuition in Ontario in the, what, early 2000s? When was this? Yeah. So it was, I would say, hold on. Yeah, probably early 2000s. So I, it's like ridiculously cheap back then yeah. i don't know how much it costs now but i think i paid like seven grand yeah canadian yeah, yeah like for, it, for was year, cheap. Right? <laughs> it was cheap right yeah, yeah it was and, cheap and how long was teachers college the program that i took was it was concurrent with my bachelor's degree okay yeah great. so it so i was, did a um a major in english minor in visual arts so that because of that it stretched to a five-year oh yeah was this mm -hmm. a where, where at school this was at york university yeah okay you went to york nice so it's in, and at the end you get you have a bachelor of education. Is that how it works? Yes. Okay, and you can teach. They teach you how to teach during this program, and you come out and you can go apply for jobs. Or is it more complicated than that? Yeah, pretty much. That's pretty much how it works. <laughs> <laughs> so what? So what did you? Uh, so okay. So we you're you're paying for it. But you have loans. How much debt do you have then coming out of uh, school? I think I had about like six thousand ish. I'm trying to remember. Okay. Yeah, about that That's much. Pretty good. Yeah, considering. Because um, again, I was like really just yeah. 
adamant about like not getting into debt which when we get later in the story you'd be like what anyways um (laughs) so then i remember graduating and i was like okay what i can do is get a job in ontario because what they do i think the i don't know what the technical term is called two over three so teachers i think you know what i mean and so for non-teachers basically what you do is once you get a permanent teaching contract you can teach for two years and then take a year off without Ah. risk of losing your contract. And so in some cases, what you can do is you can spread out your paycheck over three years, but you're getting paid for two. Or you can get paid for two years and then you don't. Um, And so I had a friend that did that. She she does that every once in a while where she'll work for two years and take a year off. And I was like, oh, I can do that. I can work for two years. I can save up and then I can travel for a whole year and then rinse and repeat. I love Um, that. But that didn't happen. Okay. <laughs> um, it wasn't very easy to get teaching jobs in Ontario when I graduated. This was about 2006-ish. Gotcha. Yep. Um, and then I had an opportunity to go to Australia. Ooh. And I thought, hey, you know what? Like, why not? <laughs> so why I bought not? a one-way... Yeah, I thought I got a one-way ticket. And then I um, went to Australia. Other than going back to Hong Kong, uh, had you traveled much before that? And we went to Hawaii when I was 12. Yeah, Hawaii, yeah, okay. We went to Europe a few times. And then I went to Australia for three weeks um, during one summer when I was in university. So you had already been. Mm-hmm. It sounds like your parents are making some money. All the while, I don't know how much they make. I still don't know how much no, they yeah. make. It's something that was never discussed. It's just full par- transparency. I don't know. Like my, sure, sure. I think uh, my dad and had a nine to five, and then he had his own business. And then my mom, again, like I said, she did some bookkeeping on the side, and uh, she she did pretty well in her accounting career. Um, okay. And so I think I remember. There was air miles like way back when, like this was like when it first came out and when they were much more generous with like shelling out stuff. And so my mom realized she had enough air miles for free flights to Europe, but we did end up, I remember we still ended up spending or not we, my parents spent it quite a bit. I don't remember the exact numbers, but because of hotels and all of those things, they Mm -hmm. they did end up spending more. Flights to Hong Kong aren't cheap. They're probably cheaper now than they were back then because there's just more flights now. And so um, I don't know if they went into debt for it. I don't know if they paid it all in cash. I'm going to assume that they did just because my mom's pretty... Yeah, good they're, they're good with money. Yeah, I, yeah, I only bring yeah. it up. It's just good to know uh, where you're coming from, right? Like uh, to be, the, you know, being able to travel at all when you're a kid is a privilege, right? Oh, yeah, I'm very lucky in that sense. Like I, yeah. I don't know many people that have traveled that that much when I was younger. I would say I felt like I was in a little bit of bubble. I didn't realize that until much later because many of my other friends were also from parts of Asia. And so they would fly okay. back yeah. every summer. And so I thought it was like a normal thing (laughs) well it's just like it's it's such a a good thing to do so young so that when an experience when an opportunity like this comes up for you to move away you're you're well traveled you don't have fear yeah and i think it's one of those things too where i've always wanted to be very independent yes so i mean i remember like going to australia didn't have have a place to live like i know that'd be scary for a lot of people and it was scary for me too but i was like i'll figure this out like I have no idea, but I I trusted that like I'm gonna be in a country that speaks primarily English, and they're yeah. probably gonna have like hotels or hostels. Like I'll figure. <laughs> like again, money was not in the back of my mind. Like I think if if I think about it now, like I would have not gone because then I'd be like, oh, but how am I gonna afford this? I don't remember having much money in the bank. Which again, later on, I ended up having to rely on credit cards, and I got into debt because of that okay but not thinking about those just thinking about like okay i'll figure this out i think even if you're not well traveled or even if you haven't done certain experiences and you want to just keep that like in mind where you're like okay i'm gonna figure this out like i can trust in my skills and to do it well it's interesting uh, like you know in a way Ignorance is bliss in, in some situations. Right? <laughs> no, no, uh, it's so true. <laughs> <laughs> so in, in a way, it enabled you to go, which, like, mm-hmm. like you said, you may not have gone if you did the, uh, crunched all the numbers. But uh, the consequence of, uh, of ignorance <laughs> is often debt. And that's, mm-hmm. that's where you ended up. So you, you did go to Australia. How, how long were you there? I was there for almost a year. So I went um, with the promise of a teaching contract. And then when I got there the school actually ended up hiring somebody else based on the fact that I don't know what the rules are. It could be an excuse. I have no idea, but they um, ended up hiring an Australian before me because I'm not Australian. And so because of the rules. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I think there's rules around that. I'm sure. And so I was like, Oh, well I have no job and I wow. got my ticket. Of course I, 
probably should be freaking out at this point. And I remember I was in shock and I remember walking out of a recruitment agency because that was the company that brought me here. And yeah. the recruiter at the time was Canadian. He was from Stony Creek, which is hilarious. Oh, yeah, it's what? hilarious. Right? I know. It's, it's like a 10 minute drive from here. Yeah. yeah. So he calls me up as I'm walking back to the hospital. He's like, hey, listen, we actually have an opening for an administrative assistant at the office. Like, are you, would you be interested until we figure out like, you know, getting you another teaching gig? And I said, sure. sure. And so okay. I did. So even before I had like a chance to think about like, oh my God, what am I gonna do for money? Like this phone call pops up. And so I was like, okay, cool. And I loved working for them. I ended up just, I think doing some substitute teaching here and there in Australia, but I never fully taught. Okay. Um, but it was fun. It was great. Like they, wow. they loved me. They opened a new office across the country. And so they flew me there to train someone. It was an amazing time. Yeah. Well, I mean, you certainly made the most of a bad situation. Yeah. Everybody else wanted to just got on a plane and gone back. Why, why, why didn't you, you were determined to stay and make it work. I didn't have enough time to really think about like if I wanted to fly back. Cause it was like, I remember getting that call. And I was like, fine, I'll take the job. Like, I, it was just one of those things where I'm like, I didn't even think about it. I'm like, okay, I'll take a job. Like, I'll figure, again, I'll figure it out as I go. Like, I think if the job was terrible or like something else came up, I would be like, no, I, now I can fly back. Um, yeah, another okay. thing was that my, my well, now my ex-boyfriend decided to come along as well. And so ah. I was like, oh, well, you know, I can't really leave because he's going to come in a few weeks. Like I got to get everything ready. And so that was the other okay. thing too that, that prompted me to stay. Yeah. An interesting uh, twist there kind of forced you to stay at least for a little bit. And then the opportunity came up. It's, it's interesting how all these things sort of just happen, right? If mm -hmm. you're, uh, if uh, you're, I guess maybe you're open, you left yourself open to like, or you told the world that you uh, were in a situation and then someone was able to find something for you. Yeah, it's just so funny, the string of incidents that actually lead me to where I am now. It's almost like <laughs> serendipitous, like, oh yeah, I flew, a, you know, I didn't get the job, but now I got another one and I love it. And okay, I got into debt, but you know what, guess what? Like, uh, we'll talk about this, but we're just like, but guess what, I flew back to Canada and I got a job like within a few weeks and now I flew to South Korea and like, hey, I don't know what I wanna do, but here's a job offer to China and I flew to China. It's like, hey, I met this guy who's gonna become my husband. Like, that's pretty cool. Like, and so it's just, Anyways, it's just really yeah, funny no, how things well, I, work. You yeah, know, I, I hear what you're saying. And, and yeah, we're going to uh, try to get to those specifics in a sec. But I, I just feel like you're open to possibilities. I, I, if you weren't, then probably a lot of you would have said a lot of no's. <laughs> right? Yeah, no, it's it's true. I mean, I, I say this very casually. Like, oh, yeah, this stuff happened. This stuff happened. But yeah, you're right. I could have said no. Like, I remember when I was in South Korea debating what my next move was. Cause I was like, I, I don't want to live in South Korea. Like I love the mm. people, but it was one of those I felt, I just knew my gut that it was time to move on. Yeah. And I remember like, I don't know what I should do. Should I go to like graduate school or should I try to make a go back in Canada, get a teaching job? And then part of me was like, Oh, maybe I'll just apply to some other jobs around the world and figure it out. Um, and so when this job offer for China came, I could have said no to that because it was, it was a new school, it okay. was a new principal. There really wasn't anything Oh, this was also 2008. So the internet wasn't, I mean, it was great, but it wasn't, isn't as like thorough as it is now. And so I could have said no, cause I didn't know much about the school. I didn't you know much about the principal. Yeah, yeah. Because again, it was brand new. And so I could have been like, oh, this doesn't feel safe. Like I might as well go back home. And so you're right. Like I think. I think in life, not just in money, but in life, like we're presented with these opportunities all the time. All the time. Yeah. And so it's really up to us to say yes or no. And again, that's probably a muscle that you need to practice as well is I think looking back when I would say yes or no to stuff, I remember when I would say no, um, sometimes I regretted it because I, I made that decision out of fear, but then I knew my gut that I should have probably said yes to it. I mean, you know, hindsight again is 2020 but yeah be open to what it is i mean start saying yes to little things it doesn't have to be like hey let's buy a one-way ticket to australia and figure this stuff out like that's probably pretty scary for a lot of people <laughs> i totally get it but there's things you can say yes to like maybe there's a meetup across the across town and like you want to there's some cool people you want to meet like say yes to that yeah you know or or I don't know, like maybe um, you're really interested in switching careers. So maybe say yes to that part-time gig for now. Yeah, and there's no harm in trying things, right? Mm -hmm. You can decide to pivot whenever you want. 
Yeah, and I've I've pivoted quite a few times. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so on that note, let's try to the, let's try to get from Australia to Jacksonville like in ten minutes. <laughs> okay, I, <laughs> I can, can I can make it quick. <laughs> okay, it's it, I I know it's tough because I'd love to drill down on everything. I used up all my time on Pez. I I don't have any regrets though. No reg- <laughs> <laughs> no regrets. <laughs> and you can come on the show again, and we'll talk about you know other things. So you. Went back to Canada after Australia. You're in debt because you weren't making enough money and you had to pay for plane tickets and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. So, and I also um, ended up paying for quite a bit of my ex's stuff as well. So I offered Ah. to pay for like, yeah, so I offered to pay for like groceries um, whenever I did fly across the country to train uh, in this new office. I offered to pay for that. I paid for a couple trips here and there. So anyway, so. Got into debt. Didn't even realize I was in debt because I was like, I refuse to look at my credit card bill. You're not even but, looking. Okay. So yeah, this is I mean, where I, Sarah's at at this point. Not yeah. Even and I knew, like, I mean, I knew my bank statements. I mean, not bank statements. My, my bank balance wasn't great. It was like almost yeah. at zero most times. And I was like, okay. you know, okay, cool, whatever. And so um, after my contract was done, I was like, I, I'm going to go home. I'm going to, again, I should probably just get a job and buy a house and I'm probably going to get engaged and all of those adulting <laughs> things, right? The like checklist. Yeah. Yeah. The checklist. And so I flew back, uh, ex broke up with me via MSN okay. messenger. Stayed in who, Australia. No. Yeah. He, he was in Australia, he broke up with me through MSN messenger. And so <laughs> if you know what that is, like, again, I'm, I'm pretty ancient That's in low. internet years. Yeah. And so I was like, Oh, and so I remember checking, I was sitting in my bedroom, um, in my parents' house, and I was looking at the credit card statements, and I was like, "Oh my god! Like, I'm nine thousand dollars in debt." Like, <laughs> it was, wow, okay. and I was like, oh, "Okay." So I remember, like, how did I get to this? Like, I know how to budget. I know all of the logical things and the spreadsheets, but uh, like, how did I? How did I end up in this? And it, yeah. it was just one of those where I was in shock, and I went downstairs, and I was like, "Mom, can I stay with you for a little bit?" She didn't even like no questions asked. Like, she just said, "Okay, sure." And I'll give she you a few got, weeks. She understood. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so she's like, sure, I'll give you a few weeks and figure things out. And um, again, went back upstairs and I was just like, oh, like, what do I do? What do I do? And so I was like, okay, well, like, what do I need right now? And the answer was like, I just need something to pay this off. Because I couldn't get a teaching job at the time. Again, like um, with unions, it's a little bit more difficult to get in as a, as a newbie. Um, number two, it was like the wrong time of the year to really apply for anything permanent or part-time or anything like that. Um, I think it was like... It's like the end of June or July when I got back. Yeah. And so okay. anyway, so I was like, <laughs> yeah. okay, no job prospects for teaching. Let me just walk to the mall where I worked in college and got my waitressing job back. Um, okay. I worked at the Gap for a little bit. And I was like, okay, cool. I'll just do this and then I'll figure it out. Um, and then my friend in South Korea taught there and I was just kind of casually mentioning like, I'd love to go overseas again. And she said, well, the school's hiring. Are you interested? So I thought, okay, cool. So I sent a sent a resume and then went through the interview process via Skype. And then they said, when can you come? And so um, a month later, I flew to South Korea and uh, lived, worked and lived there for a year. Okay, one year. Yes. And so um, just to backtrack a little, I remember mentioning like, okay, that year was up. My gut was telling me I should probably go, but I didn't want to leave, but I didn't know what my prospects were. Very randomly applied to this school in China, not in China, sorry, in South Korea, but then the principal was moving to China. And so the school again was brand new. So the new one, yeah. I didn't know anything about the principal um, or anything, but I said yes to it. When I signed the contract, it was like, oh, for two years. And I thought, huh, okay. I thought it was for one year because to me, that's all I Mm. knew was one year contracts. And I thought, okay, well, you know what? If it really sucks, I'll just, I'll just leave. (laughs) <laughs> break, so, just break the contract yeah yeah i'm like i'll just break the contract if it's really that bad and so um i flew to flew to china right after my contract ended in south korea and i lived there for about eight years <laughs> wow okay yeah. eight years okay mm-hmm. just a quick step back so you're able to pay off all your debt with the south korea money yes 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 um i paid the debt off in nine months i'd say so because so just as a quick primer for teachers it's really beneficial to go overseas because you get Mm. in most cases you get free housing yeah um in some cases transportation but i didn't get that but the free and standard living is like so low compared to north america um so essentially 90 percent of my income was mine wow i could do whatever i wanted with it so i paid off my debt what's your salary back then i think it was like thirty thousand 
percent here would be like uh, half of that and, and then uh, for in costs and then taxes but you don't have to worry about any of that in no South and Korea. Then you, you also got like pension and so when you leave you get you get that too you get it paid out yeah to you. and wow. so it was great yeah okay, so, so you're banking money and mm -hmm. and so now you, you paid off your debt and and you have some savings yeah before you go to China. i had some savings right what before when when I went to China, and then again, like I said, that's where I met my husband because we worked together. We got married in Hong Kong, which I don't know what. I just think that's very funny. But we got married in Hong Kong, <laughs> um, and then we. I was wondering if it was coming back. That's why I asked. Yeah. At the beginning. <laughs> so we got married in Hong Kong because my relatives were there, and it was easier to get married there instead of uh, mainland China. Sure, your relatives there. Yeah. Right, and so we got married in 2010, um, and then. We we're kind of like, oh, well, what should we do? Should we go back to the U.S.? We ended up staying a little bit more. Um, yeah, because I was like two years into China. So then. And you're teaching for eight years. So, yeah, that plus, you know, the other years that I was in in Korea and a little bit in, in Australia. Yeah, but eight um, years in China. Eight and years in China, yes. Are you starting to do any uh, any side hustle type things at this point yet? Yeah, so in about, I think 2012, that's when I started freelance writing as a side hustle because I was okay. bored. Like, I, no, I seriously was so, just bored. So China was, like, was boring. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Not China was boring. It was just like I was bored one day and I was like, what can I do? Oh, you gotcha. And so I I fell down this rabbit hole of like Google searches like one does and yep. uh, stumbled across freelance writing. And I thought, oh, that'd be fun to get paid. And so I pitched a couple of places and I think I got paid like 50 bucks for my first article. And I loved it. And so I did that just really very casually. And then it wasn't until I gave birth in 2015 that I realized, you know, maybe I could make a go of this, especially since my husband and I were considering moving to the U.S. because that's where he's from. Yeah. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe I can really make a go at this because at that point, if I were to move to the U.S., I'd have to get, you know, social security number, all the documentation. And I mm -hmm. didn't know if my Canadian teaching license would work in the U.S. Okay. So you're trying um, to make alternate plans now. Yeah. For, because you, you have a, you have one child now. Mm -hmm. I mean, you did then. Mm -hmm. uh, do, you, do you have more than one child now? I forget. Just one. Just one. Yeah. So you, have, mm -hmm. the, you still have that. You still have that child. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> And uh, born in China, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah, that's uh, it's, uh, that's also very interesting too, right? You know, you're born in Hong Kong, moved to Canada, moved to China, have a child there, and now living in the states. Yeah. Uh, just to wrap your head around that, right? I know, and it's so funny because whenever we tell people how my husband and I met, they're like, "You moved halfway across the world to meet someone <laughs> that lived a six-hour <laughs> drive away from you," and I said, "Exactly." No, I know. I know. <laughs> Yeah, because where, cause where is he from originally? He's from Pittsburgh, so... Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's like six-hour drive, yeah, not that bad. I think I'll be, I drove through there on the way down to Orlando last year. Yeah. Yeah, or go. just past Pittsburgh, right? Mm -hmm. So, okay, you are just randomly stumbling onto freelance writing, which is just so interesting. It's not like you had been writing books or novels or writing online. Were you Were you blogging at all? I think I started a blog... Because people said you should if you're going to be a freelance <laughs> yeah. writer. Like, again, the yeah. should thing. And so yeah. I did. I just started. It was like a, a very – it felt like one of those live journal type blogs. Again, I'm making myself really old. Like like a Tumblr blog. Like we just yeah. kind of write random things. And so I kind of gave up on that pretty fast. <laughs> um, and I didn't start anything until 2016, basically when I moved to the U.S. But, yeah, I was like – I was just doing freelance writing – um, at that point, I was doing more educational writing, so more well, like writing higher, about what you know, right? Yeah, like higher ed stuff, like yeah. for clients, higher ed stuff, textbooks and things like that. Then I transitioned to personal finance writing when a client very randomly asked me to write about how you freelance overseas. And so other people got wind of that article and then asked me to write more personal finance type stuff. And I realized, okay. hey, that's like where's more of the money's at, so let me do that. And so... So that's how you got into the, the personal mm -hmm. finance space. Which was funny because a lot of... No one really... I think the people were surprised to hear that I was Canadian. I, I don't know what yeah. gave... Like, what, what gave them the impression I wasn't, right? But <laughs> I would write a lot about U.S. finance, and it was... It was such a learning curve at the beginning because I didn't know anything about it, right? Oh, well, yeah. But it was great because yeah. it prepped me for when we moved to the U.S. And again, it was one of those where this could be like a little backup thing while I figure out the teaching stuff. Um, so when we moved to the U.S., I was like, I told my husband, I'm like, I'm going to give this a go for six months. 
if it crashes and burns, I will then be more serious about looking for a job. And I haven't had a job since. <laughs> uh, how did you meet all the people that you ended up working for? Are you conferences? A lot of them were through email. Um, wow. I remember waking up in the middle of the night in China because it was you know daytime in the U.S. and I would just call and see if they needed work. And so it was a lot of like waking up in the middle of the night at one point to do that. When we moved to the U.S., it was the same thing. It was just calling. At that point, I was getting more referrals from fellow freelance writers, from clients or current clients that really liked me and just gave me more stuff. But it was really, it's really unsexy. Like, don't let anybody tell you otherwise. It's like, <laughs> that's really unsexy stuff where it's consi like, you're just consistently doing outreach yeah, all, all the, the time. All the it time. does get easier. Like, now that I've been doing it for about seven years, it's it's easier, but I still have to email like a lot less than I used to, but I still sometimes have to reach out to to new clients or existing clients and ask for more work. Yeah, asking for work. I, we're not really trained to do that, are we? We're trained to get a job and do the thing and sit nine to five. Uh, and then we don't have her uh, use the muscle of, of asking. Yeah, it's so funny. I was just I was actually doing a podcast interview earlier and we were talking about how negotiation is part of your everyday life. You just have to like really think of it that way or asking yeah. for things is part of that. And so it could, it could be like you're ordering, I don't know, extra French fries at McDonald's. Like that, you're <laughs> asking something, right? But why sure. does it feel different than asking for more work? Or yeah. maybe why you're negotiating. It? Yeah, maybe you're negotiating with your husband like where you want to go for dinner or vacation. Like that's negotiating. But for some reason, it feels different when you're doing that with your boss. I mean... Yes, there's a clear reasons why, but it's you're doing it all the time. And I think when like going back to the idea of opportunities and how I spot mm. them, it's like we look for opportunities all the time. It just really depends on what we want or what we're looking for. And and the motivation for you to do this was just that you knew you couldn't keep making money the way you were making money if you moved back, right? Is that is that the primary that reason was, why that you was got the into initial it? goal and I, I really wanted to make sure that I had a flexible schedule for my son. Again, when we moved to the U.S., we didn't know where yet. At this point, it was like, oh, well, my husband, it's easier for him to get a teaching job because he already has a U.S. teaching license and all of that. And so it was one of those things where, like, we'll be adventurous and figure out where in the U.S. we're going to go. And so if it was, like, far away from family, then the child care duties would fall on us to figure out, like, where. Yeah, of course. You know, to figure out, like, basically, like, who you know, who's going to like babysit or do, we'd want to put him in daycare and all those things. And so I thought, well, if my husband's role right now is just to get us into the U.S. and get a job, then, then okay, fine. The primary care is probably going to follow me, which is fine. And so if that's the case and I'm already kind of figuring out my career prospects, I might as well be the one with the flexible schedule so that I can be the one to figure out child care and all of the other things, you know, while my husband has to figure out paperwork for his um, for his teaching job. Yeah, yeah, I'm I'm kind of in the reverse situation right now. My wife is going back to med school, uh, and I'll, I'm the one who has the flexible schedule with our six uh, and a half month old baby. It's a totally different situation. You can just pick up and go teach in another country at this point, right? Gosh, I'm sure you know with a, with a young child, it's like really difficult. Yep. And on top of like working, right? So I'm like here freelancing at, yeah, at it's home. it's a full-time job on a yeah. full-time job. Yeah, like. so it's freelancing at home. <laughs> uh, we didn't know anybody in the town we lived in initially. So we were pretty isolated. And I was watching this kid and he was teething at the time, which as all <laughs> most parents know or all parents know, it's it's like a tough stage. Like, I mean, all stages were tough, but that would that one was particularly I'm rough living it on me. right living it yeah. now he's got two teeth right in, on the bottom oh. <laughs> so yeah I was going through that and I think like we wanted to start potty training early anyways it was all those things and it was just like oh my gosh you know when I went through the thick of it but I'm still very thankful that I um that I transitioned because the more I did it the more I realized like how much I enjoy it mm -hmm. how much I enjoy mm -hmm really having more control over my schedule and more control over working with like amazing clients, which I have. And it gives me time to work on more creative things because I have a podcast. So I, I do that. Yeah. I was and, gonna, just going to mention the podcast. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. And it, it, you know, and I guess the bonus on top of it is like the earnings potential. So again, you know, back when I was a kid, I'm like, I don't care about money, but now I 
do in the sense is that it gives me more options. Like we have a really healthy emergency fund. Like we have a year's yeah. worth stash away. Like we just bought a house a couple months ago and our pool exploded. Um, I will show you a picture of both sometime. Like it, <laughs> it literally like it's an above crown pool and literally exploded. Like it was. Oh, yeah. and wow. We, and one of the features we liked about the helm was the pool. But anyways, that's besides the point. So we moved in the house. Yeah. The pool exploded. Our car also broke down and we needed a new transmission. So we ended up buying a new car anyway. So like it was like, OK, closing costs, uh, new car, uh, yeah. new pool. We had to fix part of the fence because of the explosion. And I'm just like, OK, like money's important and not important at the same time. Like it's important because it it took that stress off of me knowing that I had money there to like get a car or yeah. like to fix things in case my homeowner's insurance wouldn't pay for it, you know? And it gave me the opportunity to be like, I can take time off work because now I can pick up more work later on if I really wanted to, to make up for lost time and, and all those things. And so my relationship with money is in some ways the same, but re more refined, if it makes sense. Like I'm still very mindful of my purchases, yeah. but I'm much more grateful for it and, and what it can help me do and, and how it can help my family and even myself. And money as a tool, as a, a enabler for freedom so that you, yeah, you don't have to worry so much right about anything mm -hmm. you, like everything's taken care of now so the podcast beyond the dollar i mean you this, you talk about people's relationships with money all the time the idea behind the podcast is really looking at life first and then how does money play into it because i think there's yeah. some really amazing podcasts including yours right but there's other ones that talk Thank very nitty-gritty into the tactics and budget which i get great because that, that's very much needed yeah. but i think what's really missing is that like why do we need that budget like okay, like you want to buy a house. Sure. What's the first thing you really think of? Is it really about the mortgage or is it about what kind of home you want or yeah. which location, right? It's it's that stuff before the money. So that's really what I want to focus on is is that. Yeah, and uh, you had a co-host and then uh, he moved on. Is that how it worked? Yeah, so he had some life stuff. <laughs> so, <laughs> as um, we all do, again. As we right? all do. And so we had yeah. some life stuff and, and he was very upfront, honest about it. And so... He wanted me to to continue the mission of Beyond the Dollar, and so we're still friends. He's just we're just not a co-host anymore. Yeah, what happens? I mean, Jay Money had, uh, did, did the same thing with Paula Pant. Yeah, exactly. Sometimes this is the thing that we stay with, but you know, as you've had throughout your whole life so far, there are seasons for uh, a whole bunch of different things, right? Mm -hmm. And sure, teaching was a theme for a while, but it was in different places, and you were always open to opportunities and. Then the the writing thing and just to find this uh, community, as you said, uh, great clients. At the end of the day, if you just keep your mind open, it may not be exactly what you envisioned. Um, and so something I tell people is like, okay, chase that feeling that you want that comes as a result of what you want to achieve. Yeah, and like so that. the specifics yeah. of what you're going to achieve are pro may be different, but what you're going to end up getting is probably even like better than what you even imagine because like i remember thinking like i when i left canada i was like i don't think i'm ever going to come back and live here just just because not mm. to hate it not that i hate it right no, but it no. was just one of those where i'm like i knew that i just wanted to travel i wanted adventure um i wanted to feel like i had the opportunity for adventure and i and i do now it just yeah i bought a house i'm not traveling as much but Every day is an adventure. Like I get to talk with you on the podcast. I'm going to write a few client articles afterwards. Like tomorrow I'm taking the day off, take my son to the zoo. Like, so I, because of that flexibility, it, I can make every day feel like an adventure, right? So it's like, I get that feeling, but yeah. the specifics aren't, of it aren't, aren't going to be like, I'm going to go to Morocco tomorrow. Like that's yeah. not, you know. And you can get that feeling uh, in, yeah, in many different ways. So you're just saying we need to put it out there into the, into the universe? Is that Yeah, it? and it, if, if it is something specific you want, great. Like, okay, like I, this is what I want. And, and then when you do that, I mean, like if you're not into the woo, that's totally fine. There's that whole <laughs> idea of confirmation bias where you're going to look for evidence of things that you want or you are looking for. Sure. So if you want a teaching job overseas and you just start talking about it and thinking about it, those opportunities will seem like they magically appear because you're looking for it. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I mean, uh, the podcast is definitely 
been a great source of that for me just like putting having all of this out there and uh, you, uh, probably the same for you with your writing and podcasting um just you know the more you talk about things the more they start to come your way and the more you r refine what it is you uh, you were looking for too right exactly yeah okay so beyond the dollar uh that's just go on podcast places and find that wherever you find this podcast or any other podcast you can find beyond the dollar with sarah lee kane and uh, where else can uh, people find you or read uh, all over the place to google or yeah so i have um if you want to check out articles i've written for on on my um website just go to beyond the dollar dot c o not dot com it's uh now unfortunately gotcha. forwarded to a scammy video so please do not oh. go to the dot com okay. yes <laughs> so dot c o beyond yeah, the dollar yeah. dot c o and then um i'm hanging out on instagram quite a lot lately so instagram uh beyond the dollar is my username very cool but yeah so just uh keep an eye out for sarah and and i will see you at fincon yes next week. yes of course awesome looking for i'm there's so many things going on i i mean there's conflicts all over the place so uh, <laughs> are, you, are you doing a session of any kind i am so i'm speaking about insurance and wills i know not the sexiest topic but very important <laughs> <laughs> is that something you've been writing about a lot yeah so i'm actually chatting so i'm gonna do the talk with another uh, Andy Hill, uh, Marriage, Kids, and Money podcast, which is yeah. another great one. And then mm -hmm. my editor from Fabric. I don't think it's a can. They don't think of anything in Canada yet, but I think. Um, forgive me. I think I'm pretty sure there's one that's similar, um, where you can get like free wills made. Okay. Online. Yeah. 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 So that's what they do. Um, essentially, is help you create a free will. So we're gonna be chatting about um, who needs one, what kind of life insurance, and all of those things. Yeah. Okay. That's cool. That's uh, that's very informative. And then uh, I'll probably just. Uh, are you going to do a podcast on the stage? I am not this year. Um, I get very distracted by peripheral noise. Yeah. So <laughs> Tell I, me about I, I it. learned. Yeah, I learned that very early on, and so I thought I probably shouldn't um, in case I'm interviewing somebody and I butcher it. So just out of respect oh. for like the interviewee, I'm I'm going to say no. I'm going to be <laughs> waving at everyone uh, going by. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's like <laughs> it's probably the worst idea <laughs> for me. <laughs> but uh, I'm also excited. It's going to be my hundredth show, so oh, I'm excited yay. about doing that on stage. And yeah, awesome. So I'll see you next week. And thanks for coming on the show. And I'm looking forward to being on your show. I still have to book that in. It'll yeah. Whenever I <laughs> I have time, probably in September, that would make a lot of sense actually. So I will get to that. But it was so nice having you on the show and telling. Uh, most of your story, um, you know, there's so much more we could talk about. I know, drill down on, uh, on China. Like, there's eight years of China to talk about. In there <laughs> yeah, we, yeah. We, we, we just like that was like 30 seconds. Like, I lived in China for eight years. Um, that's a whole, somebody's whole entire podcast. So, uh, but it was great. I, I you know, I love uh, uh, to hear about where you came from, and it's so um, all over the place, um, you know, and inspiring to be anyone who's looking to have a you know, the non stay in your city forever and buy a house and have kids life as <laughs> <laughs> they try to teach us. Right. Yeah. And if you ever have any questions, like, um, feel free to email me hello at beyond the dollar dot co. I get a lot of emails, but I make sure to get through them. And if you do have like specific questions on like traveling and all of that, like hit me up. Yeah. Yeah. Cause you, and you've written a lot, a lot about that in the, in the past as well. Right. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah, if uh, if anybody wants to to live the the Sarah Lee Kane life, um, <laughs> yeah, email. <laughs> awesome. So yes. that was hello at beyondthedollar.co. Yes. Okay. Awesome. Thanks, Sarah. I will see you next week. All right. Thank you. And that was episode ninety eight with Sarah Lee Kane. If you like the podcast and want to see me get to episode one hundred, which is only two episodes away, please support the podcast by going to my Patreon site and becoming a patron. It's only a few bucks a week, but if enough people do it, it starts to add up. So head over to patreon.com slash bowhumphreys if you're interested. That's it for this episode. I'll be back next week with episode 99, which will be all about money and travel with special guest Beth McMillan, who will tell the story of how she saved up enough money and made the time in her life to take a six-month honeymoon around the world. 